Assembly members, we need to take our seats and start the next meeting. This initiative will be in front of us this Tuesday. The day ourselves, the day ourselves for the record, Chris, we'll start with you. Christopher Constant. Eric. Eric Croft. Dick Trey. Felix Severa. Sure. Forrest Dunbar. Dan, would you identify yourself? I'm sorry, I'm a Dan from the city treasurer. Suzanne LaFrance. Dean. Dean Gates. Um, Dyson. Fred. John. Waddleton. Thank you. So we've never shown us the record. Um, Dan Moore is going to lead us through this. This is coming up for uh, action on the coming Tuesday meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, one, this is also Liz Cruz. She's with the Treasury. And she was a very uh, involved person on the ordinance and, and helping to develop today's presentation. Uh, Dan, before you start, let me say one thing to the members. Now, this came to us from the Budget Advisory Commission. So you tell me the commission can't do something, they brought this to us. Go ahead, Dan. I believe you terminate them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I'll go ahead and start. So, yeah, so we're gonna go through just the paper copy today. Uh, we're not gonna try to work in the screen or anything. And uh, we'll just go through the, each page and, uh, and then take questions either along the way or at the end. So, uh, but our, our goal is to pro provide you with uh, an overview, very briefly, of just the gas tax, how it originated in terms of concept. Fuel and then, tax or how the diesel tax. Uh, and, and I, I fuel tax, both gasoline and diesel. And, um, and then uh, to highlight what's actually in the ordinance, because the ordinance is just not a simple yes or no, should we have a fuel excise tax? It's also, should we have all the administrative provisions that a normal tax would need to have to be fully administered? So. Okay, so if you look at page two of the slide uh, presentation that you have, uh, basically as, as way of uh, background, and I think Chairman Train just referred to this, the Budget Advisory Commission, uh, my, looking back at my records, it was as, as far back as March of this year, they got into some very formal discussions and information requests uh, of Treasury talking about a fuel tax. And so we provided some initial information so they could study that. And then we actually went to their early June meeting and uh, had some initial dialogue. And then by August 2nd of this year, we made a formal presentation. And uh, Bill Falsey, who was the municipal attorney at the time, was also there and helped to make us some presentation also. So, uh, so a lot of work was done over the last six months or so, six to eight months. Uh, it really started with the Budget Advisory Commission. And by the time they got to their August 2nd meeting, I believe it was at that meeting that they, uh, they had a resolution that they passed which, uh, which uh, endorsed the fuel excise tax and it also made certain that it was going to be all within the tax cap. It's 100% it's property tax savings. Okay, so that's a very important point. Um, so um, in following through with that, uh, the chair worked with Dean Gates to initiate an ordinance and then Treasury, since we ultimately inherit the, the duties of that, we asked to be involved and we sort of uh, took the baton from uh, Dean Gates and finished the ordinance and got it submitted. I think if you look at the ordinance, you'll see that the sponsor is both Chairman Training and the mayor. So it's really, it's truly a joint effort. But, uh, but we're doing this as a follow through with what the Budget Advisory Commission had originally endorsed. Okay, if you go to the second page, um, just in terms of the benefits of the ordinance that's proposed, and this is up for public hearing on Tuesday night, it is 100% property tax relief. Um, it is effectively revenue neutral, so it doesn't actually help the budget. It's not new revenue. What it does is it shifts the revenue so that you need less property tax and you, uh, you, you have a different source to, to use to help pay for government services. Uh, that's another way of saying diversification. That's the next bullet. Uh, so it is a significant new type of revenue for the city. This ha hasn't been done in, in many, many years. And, um, and so uh, it's about, uh, I think, 2.5% of the total property taxes. But it- uh, Mr. Dyson has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, it's actually a comment. Okay, sure. I encourage you, as I have myself, to be wary about your first statement there on page three. Okay. Because quite a few people will read that 
that it is 100% property tax related. But you yeah, may, it, it is meant to be dollar for dollar trading. No, yeah, I understand what you meant. <laughs> but yeah. it, yes. you probably have a higher quality associates yeah. than I yeah. do, but I know yeah. lots of people that yeah. jump on that one. That's good. They'd be hunting exactly. you and me yeah. with dogs and yeah. flashlights yeah. at yeah. night. Exactly. <laughs> I like having a friend on this body. And I, and I actually had heard in the press not too long ago them talking about this as a new source to help the budget. And that, that was that was a you know unfortunate statement that they made. Okay, so um, third bullet diversification. Fourth bullet is there are different types of revenue sources and taxes and things that can be done, but a lot of times you have to really evaluate them in terms of the, their characteristics. Some of them are simple, some of them are very complex, some of them generate lots of money and some very little. This one generates a significant amount of money and it also is highly collectible. It's collected every time someone purchases fuel at a station and it's very predictable. We have really good data because the state's been doing this for a very long time and they published their data. So it is, in terms of a type of new revenue, this is great, a score is very, very high. I mean, it is a really good, uh, good potential source for, this, for the assembly to uh, consider. This is also the type of tax that is very common all across the United States, both at the state level and at city and county levels. So, um, so that's another point to make. The last point is it provides more equity, tax equity. So we have a lot of people, it's tens of thousands of cars coming in from the valley every day, and they're using the city's services, public safety, roads, all the whole gamut, and, uh, but yet they're not actually having to contribute to the cost of those services. And so uh, for those that choose to fuel up before they head home, uh, all, they, three of them. Uh, all three of them, uh, they will end up contributing to the cost of Anchorage City Services. But it's not going to be three after we get this, right? They're going to fuel up at home. Uh, yeah. they, um, they, if they you believe that, that's what they told me about tobacco. Right now, yeah. we bring in $4 million a year in tobacco. They said, we'll never buy tobacco in Anchorage. We'll wait to us when we get in the valley. Right. Not the story. They it's only going to be this difference of yeah. the large. So it'll, in the beginning, there may be some of that response, but over time, I believe it'll dissipate. When you go to the pump, it says all taxes included. It doesn't give you a breakdown of city, state, federal. It doesn't do that. So you pay what you pay. So, Mr. Dunbar, there's a question. I can see his face. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have data on what the relative price between the valley gas and the anchors gas is right now? And I'm understanding is that there is already a tax on valley gas yeah we did check on that ahead of this meeting and there is a two percent sales tax in wasilla and a three percent sales tax in palm so they already are paying on top of a normal competitive price so uh so i think that's that's a good point just as a personal note i suspect what you see is the valley doing the same thing as we do mm -hmm. yeah, and i believe i believe palm uh, wasilla is actually going to increase theirs to three percent effective january one so Okay. okay, so that is page three. Page four of your handout is emphasizing what type of tax this is. It's an excise tax, and that makes a huge difference in terms of how it's uh, administered. It can be administered a lot more in a, a more streamlined way as an excise tax, and also uh, what type of approval is required. Most taxes require voter, voter approval. That's your traditional type of sales tax. So uh, a change to the hotel tax, uh, any type of uh, like the marijuana tax uh, originally was having to be approved by the, uh, for, by the voters. Those are because they're based on the price of the product or the price of the service. An excise tax is not based on the price. It's not charged at the time of transaction. It's based on the quantity typically. So it could be number of cigarettes that get imported into the city. It could be uh, gallons of fuel that get imported into the city. Those are quantity measures. And as an excise tax, by definition, and this has been determined in court, uh, it is not required to go to the voters. So by a simple majority of the assembly, you can actually adopt this tax. And the thing is that you are, by adopting it, by definition, you fall within the tax cap rules. 
So there is uh, basically it's a trade out. Property taxes go down, and the new fuel tax comes into play, and uh, it's a net net zero uh, in terms of overall taxes. Um, so those are important uh, important points to make uh, in terms of uh, savings. That may be a question in your mind. What does this save a property taxpayer? At a gross level, if you assumed a person had a $350,000 average house, which is about what it is right now, the gross savings per year would be $131 in property taxes. Of course, most people do have a car. They may have one, they may have two, they have, they have more than two. If you have one car, then that $131 savings is going to be reduced by about $43, okay? So your net savings from this with a one car household is going to be $88 is, is, our, is our projection. That assumes 10,000 miles per year being driven. If it's a two car family and an average house, the net savings will be about $45. So that is uh, our, our estimate on those is that, savings. Is that here? Is that Go ahead. I'm sorry, what? Is that printed or did you just write that down? Um, it is in my speaker notes. Uh, I don't know if it's in the SEE. It's not in the SEE. Let me check the three hundred fifty thousand home gives you what again? Okay, okay, sure. Uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollars is about the average home value currently, and that the gross savings from a new auto fuel tax excise tax is one hundred and thirty one dollars. Yeah. Okay. A one car family is it's basically forty three dollars per car per year. So if you're a one-car family, your net savings is $88. If you're a two-car family in an average home, it's $45. Okay? Go ahead, and, and the SEE does represent, or does include this, they, they mentioned 43, I said 45. So. Nancy also indicates there will not be any additional staff to collect this. And that, that's the other Thank side of the range. Yeah, it, it is a streamlined tax. We don't have to deal with a huge population of, uh, of entities that would pay the tax. And, uh, and we also have the state to follow along. They, they have a very established infrastructure and set of rules. So as we see when we go in these, a few more of these slides, we try to model very, very closely after the state to get the benefit of that so we're not having to truly invent the wheel ourselves. And that's very helpful to us administratively and to the industry. There's not a lot of big adjustments the industry has to make to comply with this tax. So, okay, so if we go to the next page, this is page five. The revenue impact. Um, so our estimate is there will be about 15 entities that will have to remit the tax to us on a monthly basis. That's the same cycle that they have with the state of Alaska. Uh, there are three major distributors and then 12 smaller based businesses, all classified as wholesale fuel distributors. And these are businesses that have the fuel for sale within Anchorage, okay? Uh, the effective date, and this is the actual revenue estimate, uh, and this is the grand total aggregate dollars um, for the city in terms of total dollar for dollar trade off for property taxes, is in 2018, which would be a partial year, we have calculated $11.7 million. I think they already have this. Yeah, they, they have it already. Uh, we're past that. Thanks, Amy. It's okay. Thank you. The, the clerk's office beat us to it. So. Okay, we just want to make sure you have that. Um, okay, so 10 months of, of activity. We expect March 1st is, is when we could be ready. We in the industry could be ready to go forward. $11.7 million is what could be generated in 2018. 2019 would be the first full year of, of this new source, and it would be $14.1 million. Okay. John, that's your question. John? Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess while well, you're on five. So, okay. I mean, it says here taxes to be paid by the dealer or user to the municipality. And in your page five, you're saying referring to wholesale gasoline distributors. So, um, but every, uh, the Shell station on the corner might be a franchise, and they have to pay. They don't. Who, how's that money flow? No, it's. Uh, I'll, I'll let Bliss respond. Go ahead. Bliss. So it it is from the wholesale dealer. So it wouldn't be paid by the actual retail gas stations. It would be by the distributors that deal to the gas stations on a wholesale level. So the wholesalers say I sold X amount, so they matter to who, but they're gonna add it on. So the assumption and the, so they're charging their retailer more, right? So the retailer's it, gonna charge me more. That's right. Saying. They'll, They'll build it into money. their price. So they wouldn't actually they would they would have to pay the city the tax based off of how much they sell to the retailers. So the retailers aren't 
paying it to them as a specific tax, but they would likely build it in as part of their business cost to recoup that when they make their sales. And that's how the state does it? Yes. Yeah, we're going to be dealing with the same entities the state does. Okay, so, so on the collection of the tax, you just follow it pretty much verbatim, but the... It's very close. What's different? Um, what are a few differences? We're actually literally going to follow their form, uh, and what's going to be different for the uh, for these entities is they will have to uh, isolate on just Anchorage sales. Right now they, they have the benefit of just reporting on a statewide basis. But, uh, Liz, do you have any other things to point out? Well, the state charges also marine and aviation were not. Correct. Right. So Correct. some of the main differences would be our refunds. We aren't giving quite as many exemptions because they don't actually apply. We, can, we aren't taxing the exact same way that the state is. But the way that they have to fill out their tax return, it's a very long form. It's like a seven-page tax return for gasoline, and they have another one for diesel. We may not have to make it quite so long, but we're tracking inventory. We would track how much they're selling. Um, exemptions would be like to qualified dealers or people who have certificates of use. We, they would be able to have those as exemptions, and then we would apply the tax to the to the sales of gasoline or diesel that are taxable transactions. So it's essentially the same information that they're providing a little bit less, and then they'll shrink it down by jurisdiction. Because right now they're doing their tax return for the state is for the entire state. So they'll take that information, shrink it down a little bit based off of what we're taxing, and then further by boundaries. Anything else, John? Well, I mean, it's probably your definition, say a dealer is means a person who sells or otherwise transfers in the municipality motor fuel upon which the tax is imposed has not been paid. Okay, so retailer sells a gallon, it was paid. Okay, so, so they're not counting because it was paid by the wholesaler. Correct. Right. That's a funny definition for a deal. It seems like it worked. Do they understand that? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what you mm -hmm. described it is the, the intent is not to, um, it's, it's the original entity bringing it in is, is, is the one responsible for the tax. And that's the concept of the excise tax. Uh, so we have plenty of, plenty of examples like a cigarette where there's just a few distributors, but at all those different, you know, mom and pops or grocery stores, whatever, they're not paying the tax. It's the distributors that are paying us the tax. And they're the ones that are liable for reporting on time and all that kind of thing. So uh, it's just a similar model to that. Anything else, Sean? Uh, no, oh, I have a few more. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, and Chris, Dean has a comment. Uh, the definition of the dealer is also very similar to the state statute's definition of the dealer. And a lot of what we've done here is very similar to what the state has in place, a lot of the language definitions. So that is supposed to make it very efficient for treasury and taxpayers involved. And also these issues that you said was a dealer, I mean, that's all they identify historically to the state's gas tax. Yes, so thank you. Uh, I just did a very brief analysis, amazing app called Gas Buddy tells you what gas sells for. And so this isn't over time, but right now, uh, the low in Anchorage is 289, the high is 297. And in the Matsu Wasala, the low is 299, and the high is 302. And so we are already underneath what they're selling gas for in the valley. Yes, okay, thank so you. Thank you. And even with the tax, it would still be slightly. Or it would be right at about the same point. I'm not sure what they're doing. Yeah, right about the same. Hey. Oh, Dan, yeah. answer my question. Thanks. Fred? Yeah, mine actually has to do with the refunds on page 10. I'm glad to wait till you get there. Sure. Okay. All right. Morris? And uh, you want to answer it, please? Uh, and what did you say we're going to wait till we get that page? We should get to the slide. So we, last year, we looked at a, a sales tax for those of us that have this day. <coughs> tax both sale and then technically use as well. If you brought something in, it was for things like Amazon, and even if you brought something in from you know, Fairbanks or wherever. And I was looking through this, and I was trying to figure out, you know, regardless of whether it be enforceable or not, if someone just, you know, let's say they filled up in Wasilla and drove in and remained here with that gas, are they technically liable for the tax or not because they're not going to resell it? Is it just a sales tax as opposed to it's an excise tax, but just a tax on the sale or is it sale and use? My, my understanding, I'd probably ask you to clarify, but it's, uh, it's for any in, uh, resale use. So if it's an entity with the intent to resell, they're the tax. If it's for their own use, I, I don't believe they're subject to that. But do you know the Go 
So it's on page, it's right, and it's under section 12.55.020A for the applicability of the chapter. So it's only the taxation of motor fuel sales or transfers or the consumption of previously I've, taxed. Is that the part that, of that? That was, that was the phrase I remember reading last night. Consumption of previously untaxed motor fuel by users sounds to me like, you know, you buy something in Kenai and you drive up here with your big gas tank and you consume it in, this, in the city. It hasn't been previously taxed. So why wouldn't that be something to this? Yeah, I think you know I, uh, we can we can follow up with you on that, but uh, I think the uh, the intent is is to is to capture the large volume of just normal business. So right. if, if there is some person that happens to have the ability to bring in some really to the small quantity of fuel from another outside <coughs> jurisdiction, I guess that's just just what happens. Uh, so. This worse. Well, yeah, I mean, every single person that drives into the Matsu brings in some portion of untaxed motor fuel. And uh, while obviously, like, we're not going to have an enforcement mechanism, uh, I just want to be clear, either by removing that language or by clarifying it somehow, that we are not turning every person that drives into Anchorage into a growth tax uh, dodger. No, that would never, ever on a I would have made different that way. Is now we buy gas here, it's cheaper. We drive in the valley, we drive around the valley. They're not stopping us and getting us to pay tax. We bought it down here, we're using it up there. Well, I don't know what the tax looks like. I don't know how the tax is written. Okay, Dan. All right, so we're going to keep going here. Um, and so the last point on page five was just the split between gasoline and diesel. So um, of the revenue that's estimated, uh, the uh, 14.1 million annual figure. 9.2 is gasoline, 4.9 is diesel. Okay, and I should have mentioned in the beginning, what we're talking about is a 10 cent per gallon tax. So that's the level that we're talking about. All right, so then we go on to page six. This is the impact on consumers. Uh, and I guess that gets right to the point I just made. Uh, so there's the 10 cent. Uh, the annual cost, we mentioned before, I said 45, it's 43 on this page. Uh, 10,000 miles per year driven, that's 23 miles per gallon the car. So that's the other assumption we made is that they have that kind of average fuel uh, consumption, uh, fuel efficiency. Uh, so uh, the total gas per gallon charge in Anchorage would then become 18 cents per gallon. Right now it's 8 cents per gallon, that's just at the statewide level. That is the original price per gallon that existed in the very beginning of time at the state. It has never, ever changed. And the city, uh, the Alaska is at the very bottom of the list by a huge margin when you compare our gas tax, fuel tax, to every other jurisdiction in the country. So by putting us at 18 cents per gallon, if you're living and consuming in Anchorage, that then ranks us as 46 out of 50. So we're still very, very close to the bottom. And, um, and in terms of the effect on people that don't live here, non-residents, so this would be the valley commuters, it could be a tourist either from out of state or in state, we estimate about 15% of all purchases of fuel will be paid for by non-residents. And of that group, about 9% of the 15% are Matsu commuters. So we do assume over time as people just fold into this that there will be you know, a number of people that will regularly purchase their fuel in Anchorage, even though they live outside of Anchorage, okay? All right, we go to the next page, space seven, exemptions. Uh, there are exemptions here. We wanted to make sure that we follow a lot of what the state does and recognizes. So qualified dealers is one area that is exempted. Uh, that's defined in the, in the state law. It's, uh, there is an issuance of a valid certificate that we would honor that the state would actually be the issuer of. Uh, so we wouldn't issue our own certificate, we would just honor what the state has already issued. Um, and of course, if motor fuel is to be exported, so let's say it's a transfer of a 
airport or the uh, port uh, and it's motor fuel, that would not be subject to this tax. If it's a purchase by a federal, state, or local government agency, that is exempt. So if it's a school bus or a city bus or some DOT truck doing road maintenance, they are exempt from purchases or from the tax. And, and then there's also provision, I believe it's in state law that we follow, if there's a loss of fuel, uh, we do not subject them to tax if they actually lost some of the product, spoilage or other, other reasons. Okay, uh, do, you, do you want to ask the question now on exemptions or keep going? Yeah, I'd be fine. Keep going? So, yeah, okay. so the, uh, it says refunds under this new deal. It says uh, MOA requires qualifying refunds requested within 90 days uh, from the end of it was purchased. So the refund is for, in this case, gasoline is not used on highways. Correct. So, is the person requesting the refund going to have to have a receipt from when the purchase was made? They're going to have to show that actually. Uh, uh, let me, uh, I'm going to ask Liz because her group is going to administer it, but they're going to have to prove that they actually did incur the tax. So, um, go ahead. So, within the code, we talk about the different types of refunds. So, if it's just a person who's doing the refund, they would have to show either an invoice or a receipt. If it's a government entity, then we're allowing... Yeah. So it's just the person. Just the person. They would have to have proof of... They would have to show their receipt of what they purchased because we would have to then base the, the refund on the amount yeah. of the Yeah, purchase. so practically speaking, what happens to me and most folks who spend time away from the highway network, I go to the gas station, got my snow machines or an ATV there, I buy fuel for the off-the-road vehicles, for the generator, chainsaw, maybe an outboard on the boat out my lake. Yeah. So, you know, and that's why it'll be $120, you know. But how do I prove to you in a credible way what portion of what I bought that day is for on the highway and not? I, I would say, um, if we go to page nine, part of the way we structured this ordinance is to emphasize the type of fuel that is subject to the tax. And if it's fuel that's primarily used in an engine to drive on the highway or the road, that is definitely subject to the tax. These other types of uses, the ATV, the lawnmower, the chainsaw, uh, those are uh, not primarily road-oriented purchases. Uh, however, for um, to keep this as streamlined as possible, we do not provide specific exemption or, I don't even know, would the refund, would the could even qualify for a refund? In that type of a scenario, those would not be qualifying yeah. refunds so because- small personal <coughs> uses would not qualify for any refund at all. And you know, when I thought about the Valley and the, the sales tax they have there, when they go pay for the fuel for all their different accessories, they're paying tax on all that. So it would be the same thing here. They, they don't get to get a refund for the sales tax they paid when they fueled up in the valley. So, so the, the key word would be the fuel is primarily used for driving a vehicle that's on the road. And so the primary use of the fuel that you're purchasing for the four-wheeler and, and the boat and all of that still qualify as primarily used on for driving a vehicle. But like aviation fuel does not apply. Right. Yeah. Gas at home does not apply. I mean, there, there's things like that that by definition won't apply. So, and we did hear from the state, we actually met with the state a long, quite, quite many months ago, um, and they told us that one of their biggest headaches are refunds. Because they actually, they are more liberal in terms of turning in receipts and getting refunds, and they spent a lot of time administering that. And for us, we're trying to keep it simple and straightforward and not incur a lot of work with not a lot of gain. So. Uh, so we purposely did not want to get into the business of doing a lot of small refunds. So that's the way we, we designed it. Okay. All right, so we covered uh, number seven, page eight, uh, talks about how we've mirrored the state. So uh, the monthly returns standard is there for both us and the state. The exemptions are very similar, uh, like literally mirrored. And uh, there's a recertification that's, that's annual. Uh, we're going to have our recertification occur 
one month after the state's deadline, so we're not hitting them at the same time. Um, and so that's something that we would follow with just a slight modification. And, uh, and then also, ultimately, we'd like to do information sharing with the state. So right now, we're able to share information on rental vehicle tax and on uh, tobacco tax. So if they have an audit that they're doing and they discover some unreported tax, they can actually, and this has happened many times, uh, they, they can give us information and we can follow up on the city's tax for that same kind of thing. And then we join forces and, and it's, it's a very powerful thing. We can only do that if the state law specifically allows us to share information. And for a rental vehicle and for tobacco, the state law says we can. Right now, fuel tax is only thought to be the state, the state responsibility. So there is no provision for them to share information. We would want over the next year or two to try to get this type of additional provision put in so that we can have even more strength in enforcement. Okay. A lot of these entities that are going to be paying the tax are very high regarded, respected, major, major name entities. We're not really worried about fly by night or you know that type of thing. And we know that the state has has a, a decent audit program they've had in place for a long time. So we are assuming that, but we still would like, if they file forms with the state, ultimately we'd like to make sure that what they're telling the state is what they're telling us. So that's something down the road that we're going to work on. And I've got two specific questions. Friends, then Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we have already said this, but in terms of the state's tax, it's a flat tax and it's not a percentage? It's, a, it's flat. It's eight cents per gallon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, do you know in uh, general with excise taxes, is it a flat? I mean, if we adopted this, it would not be automatically adjusted for inflation? Correct. It, right now, uh, the way the ordinance is written, it is a, it's a flat fixed rate mm -hmm. until the future if you ever wanted to change it. Uh, there are provisions in tobacco excise tax where it actually gets adjusted every year. Uh, and that's just based on CPI. Uh, for this tax, I would never, if you ever wanted to go that route, I would never suggest doing it every year but maybe every five years or something like that, you could go up a penny or something like that. But that's a total policy call. And uh, right now, the ordinance is not written to have any escalator in the future. So. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar, sir. Uh, Mr. Payne, I'd just like to be in line for when this finishes this report. Okay. All right, so um, next page is page nine. Um, refunds we already just talked about, so we can pass on that. Go to page 10. Um, more on refunds, uh, this is what Assemblymember Dyson was talking about. There's a 90 day period, so we don't want people coming back to us six months or a year later and saying, you know, gosh, I really need, need our money back. Uh, we, we, we try to give a reasonable amount of time, but not an excessive amount of time. Again, just simplify the administration uh, that, that we would incur. Uh, so, and if it's a government purchased uh, uh, fuel purchase, then they can show through the use of their government card that it, was, uh, it qualifies for exemption. All right, the, we just have two more pages here, and then we can open up for more questions. Uh, so in terms of the cost and the administration of this ordinance, this is on page 11. Uh, we do mirror the state to reduce our burden uh, for administration. Uh, there are a small number of filers and minimal refunds. Those are all assumptions that have gone into this. No new positions added. We actually have one position that's vacant right now. It's caused us to work a lot of overtime with our existing staff, but once we get that filled, we think we're gonna have the, the opportunity resource-wise to deal with this if it's kept in this contained simple uh, model. Uh, our intent is to, uh, to maximize our efficiency by using audit procedures that we already have in place for other type of self-reported taxes, so we're gonna follow that. We also have a database program that we're using for the new marijuana tax, uh, it's for the new marijuana tax and for the room tax, and that same type of software, we can add on other taxes. So ultimately, we take this fuel tax if it's approved, and we would put it as another module within this suite of uh, this database suite that we now have uh, that we're working on. Our first one is room tax that we're trying to develop. Okay, and that's it. Questions or comments? Mr. Dunbar, sure. Thank you, Mr. Trady. So, um, you know, th th this gas tax, this fuel tax rather, is going to impact different groups in different ways. And um, some groups that use a higher, a larger amount of gasoline uh, or other kinds of fuel will be particularly impacted. And one group I'd like to highlight uh, are taxi cabs 
expecting it because we have a lot of policy calls to make on that. Um, but also uh, TNT, Uber and Lyft drivers. And so, um, as we all know, Uber and Lyft was able to get themselves written out of SEA fees or taxes. And I think that maybe inadvertently, Mr. Trainee and the mayor have sort of cleverly found a way where they can pay into our system. Um, and uh, because they're going to be using the higher percentages. And that's totally, that's not a, tar it's not a target at them. That's just the case. But it also will impact the taxi cabs. And you have an ordinance before you, I believe it's this week, perhaps next meeting, that will drop the fees on taxi cabs. And um, first of all, I support that. I have another ordinance that Mr. Uh, uh, Gates is hopefully almost done crafting that will drop the uh, that will drop that fee even further. And I think that is a smart way to alleviate the impact of this onto the taxi industry while simultaneously uh, ensuring the TNCs pay at least something. Um, so I, I just wanted to flag that, uh, that there is an ordinance before you, to, uh, I believe it's actually on Tuesday, to, so lower, Tuesday. to lower the fees. And then I will have another, uh, another one to lower the fees even further. If we want to get creative next year, um, I would suggest uh, some kind of something directly to the drivers even, some kind of gas card or something like that to be paid out of this because um, I'm a little worried that those reduced fees won't get passed all the way down to the drivers who ultimately buy the gasoline. I don't know if I'll go know that, but the drivers buy the gasoline in those gas. Um, anyway, that's all, Mr. Trainee. Thank you. Thank you. Question for the Sunday College. Hi. Suzanne? John, do you want to go first? Oh, whatever. Whatever. Suzanne? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for refunds, how will that, is it that expected to affect, like, the municipality of Anchorage? Um, do each police officer who gases up the vehicle then need to submit the refund? Or can it be handled on a higher level? I'm just wondering yeah. in terms of the... Um, <coughs> My understanding, and I, I don't know if Bill knows as a new Mr. Manager, but I, my understanding is a lot of uh, entities that <coughs> consume a lot of fuel have their own source, their own storage tanks. Okay. And so when they purchase from a distributor and they resupply their storage tanks, they will not have any tax passed on to them. So uh, I think that's pretty much how it would work in many cases where it's a very high use entity. That, that's exempt. John? I have three little questions. Is one, um, when you figure out what property taxes will be, you have to kind of forecast what your gas tax will be, right? Each year. I mean, we set a mill rate, say, okay, we know the value of taxable property, and so you might be a million off. How much does it fluctuate, and how will you account for that at the end of the year? Um, I mean, our, our estimates are based on actual data from the state on the use of the, the gallons. So we have a good sense of what can be generated by this tax. The tax cap and how that gets adjusted each year is something that OMB will calculate and update. Uh, but we, what we do at Treasury is we provide our best estimate for what we think the coming year is going to provide. And then they put that in, and it gets matched up with all the other taxes, and it gets adjusted. The last item to get adjusted is property tax. So we give them information on all the other taxes, and then they plug in property tax, and then they determine what the maximum allowed is, and then they determine a budget that's either uh, below or at the cap. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, what happens, so that's done in the spring. Okay. Assuming, and, and now we just kind of know, because we know what the assessed value is. Sometimes we're a little bit off, actually. Yeah. But if um, gas tax comes in two million more than we expected right. in a particular year, who knows why? Um, now we've overcharged for property tax. Is that an automatic yeah, rebate? They, the I year? believe I, I'm not the expert on the tax cap calculation, but I believe they actually they factor in the prior year actual result that is part of the calculation, and then they also use the projected for budget purposes the projected uh, in, incoming revenue. So it's, there's a balance there, kind of a true up or something. So I don't think they just look at just a projected number. I think when it comes to taxes, they're 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 truing it up every year because they they always I know they always look at prior year actual. So if, if that helps, it won't help. We'll run into this. We'll have to figure out what to do with it. 
that. If it happens to be one year where there's more than we thought when we set mill rates, that ends up being additional revenue just for that year. But it should get resolved the next year that you set the mill rates. Well, when we say it's 100% against property tax, you would have to apply it towards decreasing property taxes at some well, point. So presumably it, it, it ends be up be going to fund balance if it's unspent, and then that can be applied to help reduce property taxes when you set mill rates. I mean, if that's... Dean Gate has an answer for you, John. If I may, I'm, I'm not the expert on this exactly either, but I understand that the first quarter would be insecure, and uh, I think at that time there was some chewing up in what was actually collected more food tax. But uh, the property tax levy is, is applied, um, property tax process is set after that, after the first quarter by commissions with you. So I think there's some time actually to see how things are going. And can make things a little more true before we have an actual meal that we ready for the property taxes. We do give OMB, that's a good point. We do give OMB an update uh, March of each year before you set mill rates. So we do have some information about how the year is going so far. Uh, so if we somehow, you know, didn't estimate as well, or maybe the prior year came in, you know, ended up different than we thought, that, that will be known by the time you get to set mill rates. Uh, but that's as, that's basically as good as we can do in terms of estimating and setting our rates. It's uh, we try to be as close as possible. I think when Bill Gates had his sales tax last December, mm -hmm. a third of that must have been talking about how to deal with because you don't know what the sales tax. Was that was before. very difficult because it was such a huge number, and the and the ability to predict was was low. So that was a whole different animal. Uh, this one's very very focused. Yeah, a couple. One, um, have you shown this to dealers? They've looked at it and are okay with it? I don't think we've talked to them directly, no. Okay, no. I sent it to three little gas stations and to Chevron. And Chevron got back to me and said, oh, thanks, we'll look at it soon. Okay. I haven't heard anything okay. back. But, so I don't know if silence means we're good with it, typically. <laughs> it has soon. been in the press for a while, so uh, I haven't. we haven't gotten a lot of feedback one way or the other. So. And then just to follow up on force, you know, you could make taxis exempt. They're commercial. I mean, if you make bulldozers exempt and uh, the foreman's truck at the construction site is effectively exempt. Yeah, the problem is the way our tax industry is structured, right? You've got a bunch of little independent contractors that are all over the place. I guess if they all took all of their receipts, it would be a nightmare for them. Um, Dean, did you have something you want to say on that? Dean? I suppose that doesn't even get the gap, uh, essentially for tax cap users. But I wanted to mention and remind you as well that uh, in Title 11 of the code, or by the regulations, that we do have a, an allowable surcharge for tax cabs to add on to their fare uh, if gas prices are high. There's a table for an amount of gas, uh, the gas prices, and the amount of the surcharge. It could be added to each fare. So it covers tax cabs and gas prices are high. Oh, I'm not getting it. So I think you know, that we have some allowance there for first time as tax Okay, and just follow up on that. Every taxi cab driver is saving every single receipt, trust me. Because they get deducted from their income. Yeah, I'm less concerned about them as I am about placing a large administrative burden on our employees for calculating all of those. I mean, if, if our if it was if it was structured differently where they had like our police where they had a fleet and a yard and they fueled up all in one place, I think that's a great idea. The problem is that our taxi cabs are at every gas station in the city and they're all getting these little receipts and it'd be really difficult to administer. So I think the, the better way to, to do that, to target that savings would be through the permit fees. And then at some point, perhaps even some kind of like We'll give you 100 bucks on the front end or something along those lines to, to each cap. And it's a great way to differentiate between caps and the TNCs because you just say, this is a benefit that flows with these permits that we're assigning. Okay. Uh, Chris? Yeah, so there's a voice not represented here, and I feel like I failed to not make sure he got an invitation. And that is A.S. Thompson and the Truckers Association. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we, this first was in the kind of rumor mill that this was coming, called me and said, What's happening is that there will be a work study. And the question that I'm putting on his hat for a minute to think about have is, what does this do to the price of goods in Anchorage, right? So we have an offset of the taxes, so we have a property tax relief, but then do we see, do we predict, or can we intimate an increase in price of groceries, the price of, you know, across the board, 
a substantive increase. And so I wish he were here to make the case, but I think it's something I would like to hear addressed. I, I think that is, that's a really hard question to answer. I don't know if it can be answered. Uh, I do, um, I'd say a couple things. One is I recall in my mind, and I, we were looking up gas money, but I recall prices being $4.40 a gallon or something at the high point, somewhere around there. That was very difficult on everybody. Businesses, residents, it was really hard. Um, we're now at 280 or 290, whatever that number was. Um, it, you know, the businesses that existed back then at that le level are are here today operating at a much lower level. So their cost of operating has actually come down significantly from where it was. The other thing is because it's a business, they can deduct off of their federal tax return the cost of dollar for dollar what they pay on their fuel. So it's. Uh, there, it, is, it is more money that they have to come up with to operate. They can pass it through clearly to their customers, depending on the type of business they have. Uh, and that will ultimately flow, flow through to you know, various you know, services or products that are sold and provided here. But that, you know, at 10 cents a gallon percentage-wise, it's not, it's not a lot. I mean, so I, I, don't, I wouldn't think that people are gonna say, oh, my, my bill here has gone up because of a 10 cent per gallon tax. I, I don't, I don't right. receive that. And so. Chris, you make the point that uh, the price is at what, $4 a gallon. We all saw every price for everything increase, but we never saw a parallel decrease of those and prices. And afterwards. obviously businesses were more profitable by not bringing the prices down, okay? So that, that would just be my view of that. So. John? I, I just want to address that a little bit, and, and I know Dan didn't mean what it kind of sounded like he said, but if their business faces a cost, they don't decrease their taxes by that amount. They their taxable income by that no, amount. I misspoke. There's right. a yeah, complete you're, you're confusion right. in this planet yeah. about write-offs, that right. every dollar we spend decreases yeah. our taxes, right. so it's free money yeah. for Thank business. You. Yeah. And, so and this is about 3%. Right. I'm a small business owner, and I deal with this all the time. It's a write-off. It's free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, I mean, this 10 cents is like 3%. And if your shipping costs just for within this town, again, because I have a van driving through my stores, is, you know, quarter of a percent of my cost is a trouble. Yeah, but I, I actually think about the, the container ships full of groceries, the trucks that are shipping fuel, the, uh, I just think about the larger scale things that will be kind of moving a lot of goods over time and the percentage a grocery store's margin is 1% in here. That's how they make their profit, one to 2%. And so they say that. Yeah, anyhow, <laughs> I just think that had to be part of the conversation. Well, no, thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Dunn. Our, I just wanted to follow up on what Chris just said, and that I think it's, it's correct that there are a number of uh, uh, entities that aren't represented here, although in that particular case, it's sort of interesting, right? Because we're estimating something 10 to 15 percent of this will be paid by people outside of the Scotty Bankers. In that case, it's probably a larger percentage, right? Because a lot of those trucks that are filling up with a bunch of gas here are headed all the way up, all the way up to Fairbanks or all the way down to Seward and Homer. And they're going to be paying our tax and then taking those goods. So, um, I mean, I don't know what direction that cuts. I mean, it makes us, uh, we, we are maybe extracting a larger percentage of the tax than we otherwise would from Fairbanks, from the Matsu, from the United States. Other questions? Hey, well, just I mean, doing rough numbers, if we got basically $3 a gallon fuel, 10%, uh, we're looking at 3.3%. Cents. What what this would? It's, it's, ten, it's ten cents That's instead of percentage. So. Right. But if, if they're you know if they're paying three dollars a gallon, mm -hmm. ten percent fuel is like three point three percent. It's, it's not as gigantic. Any other questions? Because it's coming up to the And like we said at the beginning, this takes six votes. This is not a little public. So your vote's going to matter on Tuesday. Unlike something else, go to public. This will be a <coughs> So, I did this before with tobacco twice, and there was a world after you voted us on this. <laughs> there is a right. world after you voted us on I mean, some of some the semi members think the world's going to end. It doesn't end. The so, it still comes up. Yes, Forrest. It's, so, the effective date of this is March 1st. March 1st. And that would be about $11.4 million in. And that's because we think that it will take till March 1st to get this prepared administrative. We have to prepare forms, talk to the industry, uh, just give them a heads up. Yes. 
The good okay. part is the state's already doing this, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So what if, just hypothetically, uh, we pass this, and then some of the wholesalers or whomever lift up their prices immediately and say it's because the, the, the municipality, no, no, I mean, tomorrow, tomorrow, like the well, day we'll after we pass this, and, and do that all the time. I mean, it would require collusion, <clears throat> right, because they would, it, between, between the wholesalers, yes. um, if they do that, what is the prosecutorial entity that we turn to to say these people are, they're gouging? Because they're telling the public that the tax that the tax the tax has gone up, but it's sick. They've got six months to to, to gouge the public. I, look, I, or it happens way more often than you think. Or uh, a bicycle. What's that? Or a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> they're going. If prices jump uh, next week, and they say it's because the assembly passed this, but we know it doesn't go effect until March first. Who do, who do we turn to? I, I, make that I know Cindy Franklin is the consumer affairs person at the state now. And I believe that's the type of uh, case that she might take. I, but I, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer. But I just I think there are uh, people in the state that handle those type of cases, and uh, and I think she that is kind of her area now. Okay. Anything else? No. Thank you. So, no,